That's you ready to go. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can just before we uh, begin, can I remind everyone that the meeting has been recorded and a copy of the recording will be made available for public viewing on the council's website. Uh, moving on, hope everyone is well. Can I now uh, report apologies? Do we have any? Uh, none, none. Right, I'm just trying to see if there was anyone uh, not yet here. I think everyone's here. Okay, thank you. Any declarations of interest? No. Okay, moving on then to item three on the agenda, the joint consultative uh, report from the first tier. Uh, JCC, um, in the minute of the meeting of the 10th of September, really just uh, for noting, does anyone have any comments to make on the report? No, okay, thank you. Uh, there's no further comments on that, obviously a very productive meeting, uh, and it's useful that uh, ensuring that everyone is working together and fully informed during the, the, the current circumstances. Moving on to an item four in the agenda and the annual procurement report for 1920 and the corporate procurement strategy. Uh, I believe, Debbie, you're coming in on this one. Yes, thank you. Right, thanks, um, no. The publication of an annual procurement report is a statutory obligation under the Procurement Reform Scotland Act and provides a summary of the regulated <coughs> procurements undertaken by the Council in the financial year. A regulated procurement is defined as goods and services with a value of 50,000 or more and works of 2 million or more. The report also details council performance in relation to areas including community benefits and social responsibility and also details a pipeline of procurement activity for the following two financial years. The Act also requires the council to develop and review annually the procurement strategy. The procurement strategy for 19 to 22 has been updated for approval with section 4 providing you with details on achievements against our key procurement aims of which there have been some significant and notable successes. The publication of the annual report and the review of the procurement strategy evidence the contribution procurement is making to the ambitions of the council and demonstrates the continuous improvement activity undertaken by the service as we work with key internal and external stakeholders to deliver best value. So Cabinet are asked to approve the publication of the annual procurement report and note the update of the procurement strategy. Thanks very much for that, Debbie. It's much appreciated. I know a huge amount of work has gone in uh, to procurement, despite all the difficulties that we're currently facing, uh, and certainly with uh, our Grow Local campaigns, etc., and the focusing on that uh, has been hopefully uh, more rewarding uh, than previously for many of our local businesses. Happy to open up, colleagues, for any comments? No. Uh, again, just to comment, and I know a huge amount of work has gone in. That's much appreciated, Debbie. Uh, and I know that working with colleagues, particularly in the Supplier Development Programme, and all of the businesses registered via that portal uh, is starting to hopefully pay some dividends. And when we get back to uh, more normal circumstances, hopefully those dividends uh, will start to show some fruition. Uh, so thanks very much for that report. Uh, Cabinet, we are asked uh, to recommend the report in terms of as to approve the annual procurement report for 1920. Note the update of the corporate procurement strategy as detailed in Appendices 1 and 2. I'll be happy to do that, colleagues. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks again, Debbie. OK, Thank you. moving on to item five on the agenda, an Environment Department end of year performance report uh, for 1920. And report, I presume, Andy. Thank you very much. As you say, this is the Environment Department's year end performance report for 2019 20. It's a fairly comprehensive report, so I take it most people will have read it. So I'll just make quickly some very key points in it. I think the Department, Environment Department, has made pretty good progress in 2019 20, and you'll see from the report that we've achieved most of our targets and delivered our planned activities. I'm really pleased that I've managed to establish a new customer relations function within the department to support our key frontline services to address customer complaints. So our complaints are reducing, in particular our stage two complaints. Sickness absence, a little bit of a disappointment. I have to be quite honest and open about it for the year. Um, uh, this is an area for improvement and we're working on it. <clears throat> Just. <clears throat> 
highlighting as well in paragraph eight that the change program for the department for 1920 achieved its savings targets of 1.933 million pounds, which was pretty impressive, and I thought in many ways, and it did it mostly through efficiencies and restructures. We've been working on a number of digital improvement projects throughout 1920 to ex improve customer experience and work. That's work that's still ongoing. <clears throat> in terms of business engagement and employability over the year, we continue to support the local businesses and third sector organisations, which is important to note as well, to ensure that the business community is successful as possible. Continue to support local residents and young people. Um, 538 people were supported through our five stage employability pipeline compared with 457 for the year before. We're also proud that we've launched a new round of our family firm traineeships. These are proper jobs with proper salaries for our care experienced young people. So we renewed four posts again, working within different in services within the environment department. So they're getting fantastic experience and some of them have managed to get jobs outside of the council. Um, <clears throat> We've now put in place our neighbourhood services model that integrates all of Clans and Parks and Fleet services into one model, and that's really, really good. And I have to say it has really helped us out of a hole in relation to coronavirus since March, because we've got greater flexibility and we've got the ability to deploy from a much wider pool of staff. Um, that they're kind of they've got generic job descriptions and they can move into different areas. Really strong performance again, as before in 1920, with the top recycling council in Scotland for the third year in a row. Latest uh, re verified recycling figure is 66.2%. Um, <clears throat> we've, through that new neighbourhood services model, we've managed the renewal and expansion of the electric fleet pool cars in 1920. So employees now have access to eight small electric cars and three vans so that's pretty good news in that area roads performance absolutely great i'm really really pleased with this and i think that's the benefit of the capital investment made by the council beginning to come through now and um, overall our position has moved from 27th out of 32 local authorities to 18th but within that um, we're probably we're either the first i don't have the detail to hand either the first or the second performing council in relation to our performance on A roads, A listed roads. So that's good. Um, the new council house energy efficiency and Scottish social housing standard, we've moved up from 74.4% to 79%. Um, in relation to housing again, then we've managed to keep our completed non-emergency non-emergency repairs are steady at 5.39 days. It's a wee bit up from last year, but we're still well below the local authority Scottish average, and I mean that in a positive sense. Um, I think it's worth highlighting the real success about the introduction of the choice based letting scheme for our council houses. And um, this is really, really, really popular with residents. And I think the main point I would want to make is it's transformed the council from a landlord of last resort to one of first resort. And it's easy to say those things, but the proof is in the pudding here and the waiting list, the number of applicants on the waiting list now has gone from the previous year from 276, 2,763 to 4,046, which for me is a very, very clear statement that people trust and want the council as their landlord. And I th so I think that's been one of the best things that we've actually introduced during the year. Overall planning performance and dealing with local developments, which is the Make the majority of all developments really uh, applications improved from last year and was better than national standard. Performance building standards team continued to be good. Um, also interestingly, maybe for some members here, during 1920, um, we appointed a corporate landlord manager to drive forward this a new corporate landlord model. Its purpose will be to deliver a more strategic approach towards asset management and how the council uses its assets. And I think that's ever more important now, given that all the events around coronavirus and how we handle our offices and how we use our accommodation and things like that. 
Environmental and trading standards both performed well, and all of that's covered in paragraphs 30 on areas such as uh, food safety inspections, annual quality objectives, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, trading standards, but also outlines a lot of the stuff that they've done working with the Life Changes Trust in relation to scams and safety and dementia, because we have had a problem in East Renfrewshire, particularly on the Eastwood side, where vulnerable people have been conned. So there's been a lot of work, good work going on in there. Um, that's a quick summary of the key points, and I'm happy to take any questions if anybody's got them. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Andy, for what is, I think, an outstanding report. Uh, when we look at the, the, the number of areas the environment covers and the number and the impact that that has on the everyday lives of our citizens, I think it's huge credit to all of our staff in the environment department uh, for delivering uh, such a robust outcome. Uh, and particularly uh, given that we moved into then uh, the, the COVID phase, which started to delay many of the issues and indeed the majority of the issues that actually stood us in good stead uh, for dealing with some of what we have faced over the last seven months. So thanks very much and appreciation to all of our staff and environment uh, for the delivery and for the work that has been ongoing. And up colleagues for any comments. Councillor Bamford. Thank you. Um, it's a great report, Andy, and I think your staff have done amazingly well during this pandemic. But I would like to pick out a couple of um, staff in your report. See the environmental health people. They have worked amazingly well. See on an almost daily basis, getting weird and wonderful requests from residents and businesses about, are we allowed to do this? Are we allowed to do that? And, and um, they've been outstanding. So can you please pass my thanks? I do say to them, but please pass my thanks on to them because I think their task has been really difficult, getting that balance between bringing especially businesses on board with, you know, complying without being overly um, hard on them. And I think so. Please pass that on. And as you mentioned, the trading standards, because we've they've had to intervene very, very quickly in a couple of cases that I've um, put to them uh, of local residents and Paul Holland and his team have been outstanding. So I just wanted to ask to pass my thanks to them. I'm happy to do that and I just want to make a point before Councillor Kane comes in that unfortunately the report's for 1920 so it finishes on the 30th of March and it doesn't yeah. capture all those things Sorry. you say so it's, it's a bit strange but there's a report going to the Council next week that will capture those things and I do thank you for your comments and I'll definitely pass them on to Environmental Outstanding. I just wanted to add it so even although it isn't in the, that report I just wanted to make it public that that I'm, I'm so impressed with their work. Thanks I'm glad you did. Thanks Councillor Bamford. Councillor Lafferty. Still on mute Alan. Nope. Shall I bring in Councillor Akane just now if you're uh, trying to get back online, Councillor Lafferty? Uh, thanks. Oh. I don't know, is Alan back? No, I'll, I'll get <laughs> in. I, really just a brief comment from me. Um, I, I think it's an excellent report. I think it demonstrates the level of uh, change and innovation within the department um, led by the director. Obviously, we are in um, difficult times in terms of um, uh, our financial position and, of course, efficiencies have had to be made, but I think they've been done in a really uh, constructive and innovative way. Uh, and I think staff are becoming uh, more and more agile uh, and able to, to do more and more things in terms of, for example, um, the director's reference to the customer service approach. And the neighbourhood services approach, which I think has been has been really beneficial. Um, so I think really just a tribute to the staff um, for their work in being able to um, move through a lot of these changes. Uh, I think to echo Councillor Bamford's comments, and I know we're going to have a further report on COVID, and obviously this doesn't quite capture uh, the, the longest part, I guess, of lockdown restrictions. But it really has been um, excellent to see the how environment staff have gone over and above the call of duty, have been redeployed. 
I've been happy to do that. I've been happy to try and make sure we keep the show on the road in terms of the services our residents um, expect and need. So I, I guess a thanks to me, uh, to the director and to all the staff. Thank you very okay, much. Thanks. I'll pass those comments on. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kane. Uh, Councillor Laverty, are we? No. Councillor Laverty, can you hear us? Are you still on mute? No, I'm, I'm sure Councillor Larry will be commenting on many of the uh, positive aspects again uh, from his remit in the environment uh, about the, the work that has gone on in the outstanding report, uh, particularly in and around uh, many of the issues surrounding roads, etc., and the significant change uh, and what we've been able to achieve uh, over the, the last year in terms of our road network, which uh, has certainly uh, been a massive improvement uh, over recent years, so I think I'll credit again uh, to the team for that. The only issue that was probably that, that was showing is red in the report is against the city deal, uh, and again, most of those issues, uh, I know our team have been working uh, extremely hard in trying to progress all of those issues, uh, but again, when, with the external partners and some of the, the, the problems that have been faced have delayed some of that, but I know that that is now moving forward, uh, and hopefully uh, we will see that uh, the, the imminent improvements in the very near future. Councillor Lafferty, are you back with yes, us? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience, uh, Leader. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I would certainly not disagree with any of the comments uh, made by my colleagues on the Cabinet, and I'm sure they will take those sentiments with them to the Budget Strategy Group later today. Uh, can I just ask uh, Mr. Cahill one thing? There was reference made to the, uh, the, the, the absence due to sickness. I was just wondering if that, like other departments of the council, was due to an aging workforce. You know, we've had people who have stuck worked loyally with the council over the years, but time takes its toll. Definitely, there's definitely an issue around that, that there is a large proportion of the operational workforce, um, previously called manual workers, that are, are in the older age bracket, and that does have an implication. Thank you. Uh, Leader, can I thank you for your indulgence? <laughs> no problem, guys, I'll have it there, that's okay. Thank you. OK, colleagues, if there are no further questions, are we happy? I think we have scrutinised the report and provided numerous comments on the report. So that all leaves us uh, to note the uh, Environment Department's end of year performance for 1920, and indeed in a very positive manner. And our thanks to all of the staff and Environment Department uh, for their support and for their hard work over that period. So thank you all. Moving on, colleagues, item six on the agenda is the estimated revenue budget outturn for 2020-21. And Margaret. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Um, this is the usual um, revenue monitoring, and this time we're looking at the period up to 31st of August 2020. Uh, it's the third report of the year. And I'm glad to see it shows a further slight improvement on the position that we last heard about at Cabinet at the end of August. Mm -hmm. On the basis of the latest information, we are forecasting a year-end overspend of £2.238 million, pounds, and that's just around 0.8% of our annual budget. Uh, the reasons for the, the departmental variances are all set out in the report, and the position actually reflects four and a half million pounds of unfunded COVID pressures. And these are offset by 2.265 million of matched council underspends. We did ask directors to avoid all non-essential spend and they've been quite successful in that. And that's netted our gap down to just over 2.2 million. So um, when we're 
forecasting these figures, we're taking into account both the confirmed government funding that we've been uh, allocated so far and uh, anticipated further government funding to address COVID pressures, in particular um, our assumptions as to the support for loss of income from sales fees and charges across council departments and, and the trust. And we should hear um, exactly how much funding is coming uh, from that source in the next few weeks. As I said, directors have already taken a lot of action to stop all our non-essential expenditure. And together with the recently announced fiscal flexibilities and use of reserves, this should allow us to manage the remaining gap. Um, details of the fiscal flexibilities and the various technical account treatments round about them are expected very soon and that will then allow us to confirm the position both for this year and obviously for next year because we're looking ahead to next year's budget setting too. Uh, however, as I always say, the forecast could change um, if the anticipated government funding levels um, don't uh, come to pass or if spending pressures from um, the second wave of COVID produce um, Further demand or a, a, an even worse economic downturn, then you know it could get tougher again. So, given um, the, the tight nature of the finances, we'll continue to monitor this and send you regular reports on the performance and the, the forecast out turn as we go through the year. So, as usual, I just ask you to approve the various budget adjustments that are shown in the report. Note the current financial position and ask directors to continue to do all they can to monitor and control our expenditure. Okay, thanks very much for that, Margaret. Much appreciated. I know how difficult it is uh, with the variances that we're currently facing and the resources and the difficulties in actually bringing all of that together. Uh, so thank you very much for the report. And indeed, thanks to all our directors uh, for the work that has been done in terms of the non-essential spend, which have has certainly helped uh, over the last uh, few months uh, to give us, to put us in the position that we are, which although still a deficit, we know that there are ongoing issues uh, and that potentially could decrease or increase. And the, the nature of the pandemic and the issues that we face is certainly uh, extremely trying. And uh, as I say, thanks to Margaret for pulling as much of that together as is possible at the present time circumstances. Happy to open up the report for any comments, colleagues? No? Okay. As I say, thanks very much again to everyone for all of the work that's been done uh, in bringing this report and getting us to the position that we are in. Hopefully, we will continue to see that uh, number come down over the next few months as additional resources are hopefully made available. Uh, but on that basis, then, are we happy to approve the service environments and operational adjustments as set out in the notes to the table and tables on pages 14 to 29 and note the reported improvement in the probable outturn position? Instruct all departments to continue to avoid all non-essential spending. Management action is taken to remedy any avoidable forecast overspends and all departments continue to closely monitor their probable outturn position. Are we happy to agree to those recommendations, colleagues? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you all. Moving on then to item seven on the agenda and the, the sale of HRA land at Barhead South. And assume Andy. Okay, thank you very much. This is a very detailed and comprehensive report, so I'll try and just summarise it very quickly. I'm assuming everybody's read it. Um, it contains quite a lot of information, but in essence, the council owns land to the south of Barhead at Springfield Road, and that land's held in the housing revenue account, and it amounts to something in the region of about 56 acres, so it's a fairly large piece of land, and it's shown on the second page on a plan. <clears throat> the land actually forms part of a much larger area, which we refer to as a strategic development opportunity. And that's in the local development plan, the one that's adopted and that's also reflected in our draft and um, proposed local development plan too. <clears throat> the master plan associated with that entire strategic development opportunity, as most members will probably know from reading the LDP, 
is that it would deliver almost a thousand homes, deliver a thousand new homes over the next 10 to 15 years, which includes affordable housing. Um, of that, around 400 of the thousand new homes would be delivered on this council own site. <clears throat> so paragraphs six and seven just set out some background, <clears throat> basically. But what's been proposed here is that the council disposes of this land holding on the open market for residential development and that we use the sale proceeds to finance the construction of council housing provision, which by its nature will be mostly elsewhere within the council area. But we're all aware of that because the, need, the demand and need on the eastwood side is the most pressing and I think that's always been expected <clears throat> by the council. Um, paragraphs 10 and 11 and 12 to 16 basically just points out that we've appointed engineering and planning consultants to investigate all the technical aspects of the site to develop a more detailed master plan. We're also in the process of appointing a qualified residential property development agency to try to maximise any capital receipt we get from the private sector developers to ensure that we've got as much money as we can from that sale to fund the council house building programme. As I said, paragraphs 12 to 16 just provide further detailed information regarding the site and all the site conditions and also um, the market disposal strategy to possibly do it in phases, etc. Um, so I won't go into them in any great detail. Um, par paragraph 17, if you look at that and there's a plan of just above it, you'll see that parcel, the parcel marked A is where the council's affordable housing development will be. Um, <clears throat> the paragraph 18 just sets out some marketing principles and proposals. So in summary and in conclusion, basically the council has a piece of land at Barhead South that's held in the housing revenue account and would now think it's appropriate to sell that for private housing in order to fund their capital in order to generate a capital receipt to fund the subsidy of the council house building on the eastwood side of the authority. So in that respect, really, I'm asking the cabinet to approve the council's disposal of its land holding in the open market on the basis that I've outlined in the report. Just note some of the things about the progress made in bringing forward the sale of this HRA owned land. And just note that we've appointed Ironside Farrer as the consultant planners and engineers, and also that we're in the process of appointing a residential disposal development agent um, to maximise the capital receipt to the council. So, in essence, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Mr. Cal. Happy to open it up, colleagues, for any comments. Sure. Danny. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just a question. Okay, yeah, on you go. Fine, sorry. The, the, this piece of land is, is owned by the housing revenue account, if I'm right, so that the full capital receipt will be given to or put into the housing revenue account to fund future council housing within the Barhead side or the Eastwood side. Just a question to Andy. Yeah, absolutely happy to answer that. Sorry, I was just putting my camera back on. Yeah, it's already been the intention to use the capital receipt, which is 100% housing revenue account entirely for housing revenue account purposes, i.e. the whole 100% of that receipt would go towards housing revenue account related expenditure. Yeah, within the, the Eastwood and the Barhead side, or just the Barhead side, sorry, Eleven Valley side. Um, I think the report suggests that it would be mainly on the Eastwood side. I think the report actually says it would be all in the Eastwood side. Now, I'm not really sure if that would be the no. case, no. Um, but that's something that I would be happy to discuss with you offline. But it's just to flag up that some of that receipt would be diverted towards council housing on the Eastwood yeah. side, which we do know suffers greatly. Yeah, I was always led to believe, Andy, you know, a capital receipt in the Eastwood side would be spent in Eastwood and a capital receipt in the Levin Valley side would be spent in the Levin Valley. Was that not always the case? Um, Muted sums and other sums. Yeah, nope. I think in relation to, the, the, there's some legal requirements, this is just from memory, I would have to check it, yeah. that where it comes to commuted sums, 
then in Section 75 agreements, there, there are conditions that affect those about locality, but less yeah. so, I think, in relation to capital receipts. Yeah. Yeah, my understanding is that um, certainly over uh, the last few years, any commuted sums, any money that's been received from cap receipts have been utilised in the areas that most that's needed right, yeah. the services yeah. provided. Uh, and quite often, and in this occasion, I think we all know the pressures on the Eastwood side no, in no, terms no, of providing social housing. Uh, yeah, so we have to factor that, that in. Aye. Yeah. Sorry, I just want you that clarified. You know, it can be used in the Eastwood side or the Barhead yeah, side. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm all yeah, for, no, you know, absolutely. building social housing within the Eastwood side. I just didn't want you that point clarified. And my other point is, I think this is important. You know, the, the if you look at that, if you want to call it, there's a very small part of that cake it's getting 47 council houses and the rest is for private homes. Hopefully, you know, when the private homes are built, a percentage of the private homes or the land will be given for social housing. Will that be the case, Andy? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand I think the answer to that would section be yes, but five. could you let me? Could you let yeah, me? Yeah, uh, I think it's section, it's section uh, 25, I think, a sorry, a, a 25 percentage of the, the, the properties will be given for social or affordable homes. Yeah, I think... That will still be the... the yeah, I I understand that as the position, but the, the bit at A is where we, we would be looking to do our council house building element. Yeah, yeah, understand. I, I just wouldn't like to, you no. know, that piece of land. We've built 47 council houses. The rest can go for private. I don't want to see that. I want a percentage of the private homes to be given over for social housing as the rest of the developments within Eastwood, you know, do. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, that's me. Okay. Okay. Councillor Bamford. Thanks. Can I ask you, Andy, about um, paragraph 15? Uh, the determination of PPIP is expected. So basically, you'll put a valuation on it. But when the developers, so Farrer will, will put a, develop, a, a valuation on it. And when it says about um, when developers come and have a look at it, it might impact, and they look at the costs involved in doing what they want to do, it might impact upon their view of costs and consequently the price offered. Does that mean that, that we will initially come up with a valuation of the land? Um, which should take everything into account, all the, the extra expenses. And then developers can come on along and go, we don't think that's right, we'll offer you less. So we could then potentially get lots of developers coming in and ask, offering much less than we think it, it it's actually worth. So could it be that potentially we won't get as much for this land as we would expect? And given that they are barons, or what, what's their name? Um, Ironside Farrer, sorry, Ironside Farrer, as experts in their field, surely that they give an expert opinion, taking all these things into account, that valuation should be accurate. I'm just a bit concerned that we end up, um, and although we've got a valuation, we end up in a, a kind of bidding process where all the developers offer substantially less and we have to take one of the low offers. Right. Well, what we will do is, as part of the process, we would be calculating what we think of the land, but there will be abnormals that will be taken into account in doing that, some of which might not be apparent until some site investigations are, are, are undertaken. When it comes to the marketing, it will be up to developers to submit what they think is their valuation of the site based upon what they understand to be the constraints. I, I, so I hope that kind of answers your questions. Some of them, it's up to the developers to be innovative about how they deal with abnormals and constraints within the site, so as to be able to then offer the council the best price for the site. But I'm assuming that Ironside Farrens will have done some some kind of um, exploration as to the site and any issues within the site. So their uh, their price or their valuation should be reasonable. I'm just recalling Drumby Crescent when um you know there was the, the variation in offers was was huge um and, and obviously the the what we 
accepted in the end what was reasonable but obviously the press got a hold of that and it made it look like we had turned down better offers which is a slightly different story but in this I'm just concerned that developers will come in and offer substantially less when if we've come up with a reasonable price with expert advice and expert excavations and taking account of the land and all the possible extra expenses involved that have almost like a a kind of bottom price that we would expect developers to come up with, knowing that, say we valued off the top of my head five million and the four developers thought oh, we'll only offer two or three million. Nobody's going to offer that and we'll have to take a low a low price. If we don't get a kind of um, minimum price, would we refuse to sell it or do we just take whatever the best offer would be? No, we don't have to sell the land. We don't have to accept any offer. Beyond be below what was reasonable to expect, then I wouldn't. Rec I would recommend that we didn't accept it. In fact, I would just say we're not going no. to accept <laughs> it. Um, if, I don't really want to go into detailed issues, um, particularly around Drumby, but you will members will recall there were a range of offers submitted, some of which I dismissed or recommended be dismissed because they weren't suitable offers. However. Other offers, other offers were far more generous, much more realistic, and didn't have strings, terms, and conditions attached to them by the developers. So, anything that any proposal to dispose of this land would have to be satisfactory, in my view, before I would even make a recommendation that we accepted any offer. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Andy. And I, I would agree. I know that the number of offers in terms of uh, Drumby. The higher offers all had strings attached by the developers, uh, not by ourselves. And that was a significant difference because we would have ended up getting significantly less uh, because of that. Councillor O'Kane. Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, Andy, can I just have some clarity on paragraph 17? Uh, and just in terms of what we're saying, how our commitment to building council houses on the site is? Because my reading of that is we are still going to uh, deliver council houses on that site, but we are obviously then looking to dispose other parts of it. It's just, I'm not clear on, you, you, obviously it says that we're going to use uh, area A in terms of council housing, but also we're going to seek to market that first. So sorry, I was just confused. Are we, are we using a portion of section A for council housing and selling the rest of it? Uh, I, I understand that to be the position, but I'll be happy to clarify that with you afterwards if you want. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I, think it, I think it's a useful uh, demonstration of our commitment to continue to deliver a council house programme in Barhead and to continue to deliver something on that site, but to get the goodness, if you like, out of the rest of what is a very large site to then reinvest into council housing across East Hampshire in a corporate fashion. And I think just to perhaps uh, echo some of what Councillor Devlin said, we know where our priorities are and where our needs are, and we have a need across the authority. We have a particular need in Eastwood. Um, but it's about the balance and about the goodness of that money being able to be put where it needs to go in terms of our priorities as a council. So um, I think we are all very supportive of council housing and, and having it built. And I think it's good if we can do something on this site, absolutely. Um, and then get, as I say, the, the good financial benefit to drive forward the programme uh, across the authority. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Kane. Councillor Lafferty. Hear me okay, eh? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Leader. Uh, I, I must say I'm delighted to see this uh, development uh, moving uh, forward. As formerly as convener, uh, we had hopes to develop that area, uh, Springfield Road. But however, uh, events elsewhere, I think 2008 crash put, uh, undermined the confidence of the construction industry and in its uh, not progressed as well as it could. I'm reassured to hear the director's robust view that it's not a case of disposing of this site at all costs, trying to maximise our result, a payback from it, but ensuring that we get the we meet the needs uh, of our community with applying affordable housing where it can have the greatest effect. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Lafferty. Yeah, and again, thanks, uh, Mr. Cahill, for uh, highlighting some of those issues. I think it is pertinent 
Uh, I mean, in an ideal world, we wouldn't need to sell any council land to, to raise funds to build council houses. Uh, that is not, unfortunately, not where we are. And so making use of the assets that we have to provide uh, for good quality council housing across the area uh, is, I think, uh, testament to how we believe things should be done across the area. Uh, we represent East Renfrewshire, and we are looking to ensure that everyone across East Renfrewshire has the opportunity uh, to, to have social housing and that we deliver uh, for that need across the whole authority. And I think that is vitally important uh, to ensure that we deliver those services. So thanks very much, everyone, for your report. Thanks, Mr. Cahill, for uh, bringing the report forward and for being robust, as has been mentioned, and ensuring that we get the best possible value uh, for everything that we do. On that note, colleagues, I'd be happy to recommend that we approve the proposal that we dispose of the land holding on the open market for residential development on the basis outlined in this report, and that the sale proceeds are used to finance the construction of council housing and provision elsewhere within the council area. Note the progress made in bringing forward the sale of HRA-owned land at Barhead South. Note the appointment of Ironside Farrer Limited as consultant planners and engineers to secure planning permission in principle and to investigate and prepare the technical information required for marketing purposes in respect of the sale of the land at Barhead South, and note the intention to appoint a residential development agent to assist with the marketing and disposal of the land in order to secure the best value to the council. I'll be happy to approve that paper, colleagues. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, moving on then, item eight on the agenda, the update on cleaning services and PFI schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, by Director of Education. Yeah. Do we know who's moving this report? No, no one, no one holding up their hand. <laughs> Councillor Buchanan, Marie. if you just give me a second, I'll just try and um, check with Mary. So if you could just um, give me one minute to do that. Yeah. OK, thank you. Hi, Tony. She'll be with us in just a minute if you just okay. give her a minute or two. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. I think Paul's got his hand up. I don't know, Paul, Councillor Kane, if you want, we're happy to wait for Mary coming to introduce it. Sorry, um, yeah, no, just it was just in the absence of Mary, I would have uh, spoken to the paper yeah. if that was helpful, but um, I think if Mary's coming, we should just probably we'll fire. I would, I would guess a lot of the, the questions will be for on a technical aspect. Uh, I was going to say um, if there are any questions on the PFI side, I can I can help out as well.
Okay, I assume Mrs. Shaw is maybe having some difficulty getting into the meeting. She is just coming in. I've just invited her into her diary for the meeting, so um, I have tried, but maybe Eamon can <coughs> help me as well with that, trying to get her into the meeting. No, oh, I'm here. Oh, yeah. she's here. Okay, Welcome, thank Larry. you. <laughs> anyway, I was, all I was doing was sorting out my files and sort of deleting things and burying the, burying the skeletons. <laughs> anyway, um, this paper is um, really just to bring you up to speed with um, the um, issue that I think we brought to you um, well before lockdown and probably um, I, I, this time last year. I can't quite remember and don't have the paper in front of me. But um, what we did see, as predicted, uh, and you remember your previous decision about um, taking those services in-house, but what we have seen is an improvement in those services, and um, but um, and, and what we're moving towards is another review date. And what we're asking Cabinet to do is to um, allow us to continue to work. I think we just haven't been able to progress the Cabinet decision given a uh, lockdown and so on. But services have improved in both St Ninians and Mairns Primary School. And um, we're looking to have another review date in 2021, Margaret, am I right? Yes, so I, think it's, I think it's August, August 2021 is the next review date. So uh, what we're asking Cabinet to do is to allow us to extend that contract, not take forward that work at this point, but look again uh, and indeed reconsider whether or not it will still be worthwhile bringing them in-house. Thanks very much for that, Mrs. Shaw. I uh, appreciate that. I remember that I do remember well the last discussion and some of the difficulties that we were facing uh, in many of our schools uh, due to the standard and quality of the cleaning. I very much welcome uh, the fact that the cleaning seems to have improved significantly, uh, particularly given in light of the circumstances that we are now in, where yep. uh, cleaning is all the more relevant than. Uh, than ever uh, in ensuring that surfaces are properly treated and that we minimise uh, infection spread. Uh, so I'm delighted to see that that at least has improved. Uh, but obviously we would expect that to continue to be the case uh, with ongoing improvements and uh, you know, in the hope that you know significant changes have occurred over the last seven months, which make that service all the more vital. Happy to bring others in on the, the conversation. Councillor Kane, your hands are raised. Thanks, Chair. Um, you know, I think obviously COVID has had an impact in terms of our process around this. I am still very much committed to the principle of bringing services back in house. I think that is the right thing to do. I think it, it chimes with the ambition of this administration um, to ensure that council services are delivered by council staff. And that said, we are in a very challenging situation. Cleaning of our schools um, and ensuring we have the requisite staff to do that is of paramount importance at the moment, and it was of paramount importance in terms of the return to school. So um, I am content that we continue with the arrangements at the moment, but we do continue with the review process. We have obviously outlined in this paper a review date, uh, and I would be keen that we continue to work towards bringing those services in-house because I think it is the right thing to do. And certainly I will um, be speaking to the new director about that as well. So, um, but thank you to Mary for, um, for her work on this. Um, and uh, maybe that, I think that we just need to re-establish here on the record our commitment uh, and, and move forward, um, obviously, with the, the knowledge that COVID will continue to impact us uh, through the rest of the school year. Yep. Thanks, Councillor Kane. Any other comments? Mrs. Shaw. Yeah. Th th thank, thank you, Leader. Um, I, I, you know, absolutely remain committed to delivering on the decision that was taken by Cabinet a number of months ago, uh, and indeed, I think part of the um, argument that we made at that point was that when we take full ownership of both buildings, this will save us a bit of time if we have done this part of the process 
and you'll remember that there were the members of staff as well. So I'm happy to support um, Councillor O'Kane's position on this uh, and make sure that we um, build that into our own work processes uh, between now and August next year. OK, thanks very much for that, Mrs Shaw. Yeah, I think we all appreciate the difficulties uh, that would have been uh, happened had you tried to take it in-house during this period, but we have to work with the circumstances uh, that we have. Uh, so happy to approve that the cleaning service is considered uh, at the next review period, but I think we all, in essence, want to see as many of the services delivered by ourselves. Uh, across the authority, and I think that's uh, the, the right way for us to go. So happy to uh, note the report at this point in time. Are we happy to do that, colleagues? Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, that concludes our business this morning. Sorry, Councillor Kane, were you wishing to come back in? Sorry, no, I just my hands being left right. up. Apologies, Chair. No, no problem. Uh, OK, colleagues, thanks very much uh, for your attendance this morning. Uh, thanks for all of the reports. Uh, it's all much appreciated. Uh, and thank you again once to, to all uh, for the difficult times that we face for bringing these reports forward and ensuring uh, that the, business, the work of the Council continues as normally as is possible. So thank you all. Much appreciated. Good, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.